Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this another day. Neither promised nor guaranteed, but the day that you've granted unto us. And for that, God, we say thank you. And because you've given us another chance, God, we know there's another chance to hear from you, to walk in your ways, and to see you better than we saw you of yesterday. So speak to our hearts, Father, we pray. Open our ears so that we can hear. Open our eyes so that we can see. Remove distractions. Forgive us of sin, of any rumble, roadblock or stumbling block that may be in our way from drawing closer to you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we're going to be in 1 Kings. I know we're a little pressed for time, so um, uh, we're going to continue to press through these passages of Scripture. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 24. Um, and But before we get to 1 Kings chapter 17, I just want to ask a question. And I want you to put a comment in the, on Facebook or YouTube. Have you been watching the Olympics? The Tokyo, they call it the, the 2020 uh, Olympic Games, and it's happening in 2021. But have you been watching the Olympics? If you've been watching the Olympics, just put in the chat box some of your favorite uh, sports that you've been watching. I've been watching the Olympics. I've been watching stuff I didn't even know was a sport. Horses jumping over sticks. I was watching that. Didn't even know how, what, what the rules were, but I was watching it. I was watching water polo, watching diving, of course, track and, track and field. I watched a little judo. I couldn't understand how they knew who got what point, but I was watching it. Skateboarding, Dr. Davis. I was watching some skateboarding, some, um, some ping pong, a table tennis. All, all kinds of sports were going on. But you know, at the end of each competitive uh, round, they have something called the award ceremony, where the winner is awarded a gold, silver, or bronze. It's an award ceremony. And they stand up on a podium, and if you won first place, they play your country's national anthem because you succeeded. You won. And we, 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 we share in the joy and we share in the tears of those individuals who won. And it's a great thing to see. But you know what we don't see? We don't see the work that they put in to get there. We see the mountaintop experience that they have at that moment standing on that podium, but we don't see the hours that they spent in the gym, the years and the sacrifices and the injuries that they had to endure to get to that podium. We clap for the medals, we clap for the gold, we clap for the silver, we clap for the bronze, but we don't see the pain, the blood, the sweat, and the tears that they put in. My brothers and sisters, as we study uh, the life of Elijah, he had a gold medal experience. Matter of fact, in 1 Kings chapter 18, before we get to our lesson, I want you to see this gold medal experience that Elijah had. If you will flip your Bibles from 1 Kings chapter 17 and go to 1 Kings chapter 18, we find Elijah in verse 36 at the top of a mountain. And that was Mount Carmel. It was, this is his gold medal ceremony. He's standing on a podium. Matter of fact, it's an audience full of people. Everybody that's here on Mount Carmel are there because King Ahab in verse 1 of chapter 18 has called everybody up to Mount Carmel. And so he has a huge audience. Not only does he have a huge audience, he has a huge competitor that he's going up against. He's going up against over 800 prophets of false gods. It's a competition. It's, it's, it's winner takes all here on this mountain Elijah is competing against over 800 false prophets of false gods. He has an audience. All of Israel of the northern kingdom is there. And right here in verse 36, it says, At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today, let it be known that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, Elijah prayed. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God 
God and that you have turned their heart back again. Verse 38, here's the gold medal. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed a burnt offering and wood stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in a trench. When all the people saw it, they fell down on their faces, verse 39, and they said, the Lord God, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Finally, verse 40, Elijah said to them, seize these prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. This was a mountaintop gold medal experience for Elijah. The mighty power of God was shown in a mighty way in front of thousands of people. There was a huge arena on top of a mountain. And there Elijah stood, showing himself to be God's man, God's chosen one, God's prophet. One against 800 and a one came out on top. God put that gold medal around his neck, struck that altar with fire, and let him know, this is my child, this is my prophet, and I am the true God. He had a mountaintop experience. But before he stood on that mountaintop experience, Elijah had to go through a valley of training. In 1 Kings chapter 17 is the valley of preparation before Elijah could step on his podium of gold medal stands in chapter 18. And it's like many of us, before we can have a mountaintop experience of seeing God in a new way, he prepares us in the valley. He prepares us through trials. He prepares us through adversity. He prepares us through difficult situations in life so that we can come to that mountaintop experience and be approved by him in front of others. But before you get your gold, you got to go through. God has to train us. God has to mold us. And when we enter in chapter 17 of 1 Kings, we see that God has given Elijah a few situations in which he was training him to get ready for chapter 18. Matter of fact, we know that this was a three and a half preparation time because in chapter 1 of of Chapter 17, God told Elijah to tell Ahab that there was not going to be any rain for three and a half years. For three years, there would not be any rain. And for the next three years, guess what was happening with Elijah? He was being prepared. He was being prepared for something bigger. He didn't know that chapter 18 was coming. He didn't know that the gold medal ceremony was coming. But God knew, and he was training him. What were some of these training opportunities that Elijah had briefly? The first one that we see in verse 1 is that he had to step up and be able and willing to speak to King Ahab and Jezebel. He had to be obedient to God to let them know you have been disobedient and and God is going to hold back the rain. He had to go through training. Are you going to be obedient? After he had spoken to Ahab and uh, uh, Jezebel, God told him in verse 3, I need you to get up out of there. Because they're going to attack you. And I need you to go down uh, eastward, verse 3, and hide yourself by the brook, which is east of the Jordan. And it shall be when you get there, you will drink from the brook, and the dirty birds will feed you. Them ravens, again, not the Atlanta hawks. Them ravens will feed you. And look at what happens in verse 5, because he's in training. God spoke, and in verse 5, you know what Elijah did? He did exactly what God told him to do. He's in training. He hears the word and he responds to what God's telling him to do. And then after he hears the word and responds to God, he goes down to the brook. It's his three-year training period. He's down at the brook, but eventually because of the drought and because God is preparing Elijah, the brook dries up. And God tells him after the brook dries up because there was no rain in the land. In verse 7, it says in verse 8, and this is where Dr. Wesson talked from last week and walked us through the word in a powerful way. He says in verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there, because I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. After God spoke in verse 9, look at what happened in verse 10. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. He was in training. Every time God spoke, he trusted God and and he adjusted his life to the word of God. He didn't know that chapter 18 was coming. He didn't know that this mountaintop experience was coming. All he knew was that I need to trust God day 
by day. Matter of fact, Elijah describes himself as someone who is very intimate with God. And this is something as believers, we need to understand that even in our seasons of training, even if we don't recognize it as a season of training of God, proving us of God, developing our character, the one responsibility that we have is to make sure that we're in intimate fellowship with God on a daily basis. Elijah knew that he had an intimate relationship with God. If you just back up with me to verse 1, when he was describing who he was to Ahab and to Jezebel, he says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand. He says, I got a serious relationship with God. I'm intimately acquainted with God. I'm not perfect. I don't do everything right. But one thing I'm serious about is walking in the ways of God. He says, I stand before him. Me and God are tight, like white on rice. That's right, Pastor. He's a, he was a man like David after God's own heart. I may have failures. I, I may have faults. But you know one thing I do? I love the Lord because he's heard my cry. Elijah says, I'm intimate with God. So when he speaks, I move. When he tells me what to do, I do it. So every time God tells him in this period of preparation, he responds. He told him to go to Zarephath, and he went. Matter of fact, Jesus makes a comment on this in Luke chapter 4. We don't have time to go there, but if you make a reference in Luke chapter 4, Jesus tells a story about Elijah and says that Eli there were many widows in Israel who Elijah could have went to. But God did not send them to widows in Israel, but he sent them to a widow in an ungodly town. Jesus even said there were many people, many other places that God could have sent Elijah, but he sent them to an ungodly place, to an ungodly group of people. Matter of fact, he sent them to Jezebel's hometown. And Elijah didn't question, didn't ask any questions. You know what he did? He obeyed. He was in training. And while he was there with the widow, another miracle happened. The widow thought she was about to die, but she didn't even know that God had already set her up for a blessing. God said to Elijah, I've already ordained her. I've already ordained her. I've commanded her. She don't know about it yet, but she's, she's set up for a blessing. And when he ran into the widow, the widow told him, I'm about to die. We don't have no more food. Me and my son. My husband is gone. My son, is he too little to do anything for me or he, he uh, is incapable. Elijah says, don't you worry about that, because the Lord has said, in verse 14, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the joy of oil be emptied until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. Elijah, by the Spirit of God and having an intimate relationship with God, was able to prophesy on the word of God that you don't have to worry about nothing else, because God is going to provide for you until it rains again. This is a period of training. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, I, I dare challenge you to look back over your life and some of your mountaintop experience where you experienced God in a fresh and new way, where you saw God in a new and anointed way. But before that, didn't God take you through some training? Didn't God have to break you down like a fraction? Didn't he have to take you through the exercise of testimonies? Didn't he have to put some weight on your shoulders? Didn't he have to move, remove some people out of your life and bring some people in your life? Didn't he have to move you from one place to another place? Didn't he have to adjust your hearing so you could stop listening to the world and listening to the word? Didn't he have to adjust you from being disobedient to being obedient because you tried it your way, you tried it your way, but you ended up, ended up doing it his way? And each time you learned that if I just do it, God, God's way, the quicker you did it God's way, the next time he told you something to do. We can all see, we can all see, we can all see the times of trials that we have been through, but we need to see these times of trials as God preparing and growing us and bettering us for a mountaintop experience. Matter of fact, matter of fact, matter of fact, Matter of fact, I'm getting excited. I'm going to bring this up. But let me, throw some, let me throw some verses at you that we're so familiar with, that we're so familiar with. If you go to James chapter 1, it talks about these trials, these preparations, these, these issues, these fistitudes that we go through. And James says, when you find yourself being trained by God, when you find yourself going through difficulty, when you find yourself going through the valley of preparation, James said, you know what you ought to do? He says in verse 2 of chapter 1, he says, count it all, joy. 
He says, count it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials. Why should I be happy? Why should I smile? Why should I uh, 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 feel good when I'm going through the crucible of the fire? He says, I'm glad you asked. He says, because the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect work so that you will be perfect. That's mature and complete. Lacking nothing. That, that word got so good to Peter that Peter said, I want to say something just like that. I want to say something just like that. And in first Peter chapter one, verse six, he says, there's time for you to rejoice when you go through uh, 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 when you go through for a little while, if necessary, because you've been distressed by various trials. Peter reminds, he echoes James, he said, you're going to go through, but know that you're going through is a going through. It's a test and it's temporary and it's preparing you. What is it preparing me for? He said it's preparing you to look a little, just a little bit better. Matter of fact, in verse 7, he says, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. To sum it all up, he says, you are going through so that you can grow and God can be glorified. Are you going through today? Are you in a valley of preparation? Do you find yourself being stressed by various trials? Do you see yourself being beaten up by various ordeals? Maybe God is preparing you for your chapter 18. For your mountaintop experience. Maybe he's, he's preparing to put that gold medal around your neck. And you know what? Your gold medal may not come on this side. Your gold medal may come when you see Jesus face to face and he give you your crown on your head. And then you know what you're going to do with that crown? I'm sorry, y'all. I'm getting off. I'm getting off base. I'm getting off base. But when he put my gold medal on me, when he put his crown on my head, I'm just going to throw it back at his feet. Are you going through today? Are you experiencing some hard? Are you in your chapter 17 like Elijah? Well, let us walk like Elijah. Let's be intimate with God. And when he speaks. Let us obey. It's almost time for us to go. We just now getting to our lesson, y'all. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Let's look at it so we can get through. Chapter 17, verse 17. It says, I, I, I like how the, 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 the Holy Spirit directed the, 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 the writer. It says, now it came back, it came about sometime later. My Bible, it says, it came about after these things, sometime later, after these things. What are these things? What is sometime later? What's after sometime later? Well, we've already walked through it. After Ahab had stood up with courage, I mean, I'm sorry, after Elijah stood up with courage to Elijah, after Elijah stood up with courage to Ahab and Jezebel, after these things, after Elijah found himself on a run, sitting at a brook, drinking water out of his hand and taking food from the bird, after these things, after Elijah was told by God to go find a widow at Zarephath who thought she was about to die, but God blessed her to have oil and flour for as long as there was a drought and Elijah was to stay with her, after these things something happens. What happens? The Bible says that the son of the woman, this is the widow who Elijah was staying with, the mistress of the house, the son became sick and his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. After these things, after God has provided, after God has come through, after Elijah had been obedient, after the woman had been obedient, after she obeyed the word of God that was brought to her through Elijah, after she scooped the flour, baked the cake, made the uh, flour with the oil, after she gave Elijah water, after she gave him a room, after all these things, after all these periods of preparation, after all these periods of being obedient to God, the son dies. And many of us have been there. We, we can look back over our lives and there's been pointed times in our lives where we're doing it God's way. I'm listening to God. I'm, I'm doing what you tell me to do. I'm adjusting my life as you tell me to adjust my life. I'm going where you tell me to go. I'm doing what you tell me to do. I, 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 I trust that you're going to provide. I don't have a dime to my name, but I'm trusting that you're going to come through. And after I'm doing all this for you, tragedy still happens. The song says tragedy are common place, all kind of diseases. 
And the Bible says after these things, tragedy hits. And many of us can testify like the woman, the widow, and like Elijah, that even after we've done everything that God called us to do, tragedy comes knocking at the door. And when tragedy comes knocking at the door, the first thing many of us try to do is try to rationalize why this has happened. And if we can't blame ourselves, we'll blame somebody else. And this was the example that the widow gave after these things. In verse 18, she was trying to rationalize. I, 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 I've done what this prophet has said. I've, I've, I've cooked him cakes. I, I've made his bread. I've given him water. I've given up one of my rooms in, in my house. And she says in verse 18 to Elijah, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me, bringing my iniquity to remembrance and put my son to death. It's your fault, Elijah. The reason why my son is dead is because of you. The widow was trying to wrap her mind around this tragedy. And many times when we find ourselves in difficult predicaments, instead of seeing God at work, we see the fault of man. And she blamed Elijah. It's your fault. Because you are a man of God, and because God is so close to you, he sees how bad I am, and that's the reason my son died. My brothers and sisters in Christ, some of us can identify with this widow woman when we find ourselves in tragic situations. We ask the questions, why me? Why this? Why now? And when we can't find no other answers, we blame ourselves or we blame somebody else. She was hurt, so she lashed out. She tried to hurt Elijah with her words. The son died. But while she was looking to man as a reason for the problem, Elijah was looking to God for the answer. Let me say that again. While she was looking at man as the reason for the problem, Elijah was looking at God for the answer. And when we go back to the story, it says in verse 19, he said to her, give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him up to the upper room where he was living, and he laid him on his bed. Verse 20. He called to the Lord. And he said, O oh Lord, my God. Have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I'm staying by causing her son to die? He says, Elijah didn't know the answer, but he knew somebody that had the answer. Elijah didn't have a solution, but he knew somebody with the power to bring about a solution. And I wonder, I wonder in my sanctified imagination as he was talking to God, was he remembering how God provided for him at the brook, how God brought him the ravens to give him food, how God gave him water out of the brook. I'm wondering if he was remembering how God had directed the widow to prepare for him the food that he needed and the water that he needed to drink. I'm wondering if he was remembering how God had took care of him in the face of Ahab and Jezebel because these past situations gave him the present faith to still talk talk to God about his situation. And maybe he wasn't thinking about his, maybe he wasn't thinking about his personal testimony. Maybe he was thinking about how God brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea. Maybe he was thinking about how God had brought water out of a rock. Maybe he was thinking about how God for 40 years fed the children of Israel with manna and quail. Maybe he was thinking about how God made bitter water sweet. That's why we know God made sweet tea. The first sweet tea was ever made by God. Maybe he was thinking about how God had delivered and delivered and delivered. So now when he was calling out, out, he says, oh, Lord, my God, I know who you are. I don't know the answer to this situation, but I know who you are. And I want to encourage us, brothers and sisters, to analyze ourselves when we find ourselves in difficult situation. Are we quick to blame man or are we quick to talk to God? The widow was quick to blame man, but Elijah gives us a lesson that when I find myself or when I find others in predicaments that I don't know the answer to, I'm going to take it to God in prayer. He took it to God in prayer because we can imagine that Elijah, having seen this boy for over a couple of years and 
possibly having played with this boy and mentored this boy, that he was hurt too. He was hurt that this boy had died. He, he had invested in his life. He, he was with him every day. He ate with him every morning, every noon. And this boy probably seen Elijah praying and asking him about God. And now this boy has up and died. Even Elijah felt helpless, but he knew a God that could be helpful. And a lot of times, my brothers and sisters in Christ, what we need to understand is when loved ones go through, we can feel helpless because we don't have the resources or we don't have the knowledge to help them. But if you've got a relationship with God, you can take their problems to the God you serve. While the widow wasn't talking to God and she was mad at Elijah, Elijah took the situation to God. So he prays. He prays. He prays to God and he stretched himself in verse 21 upon the child three times. And he called to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, my God, I pray you let this child's life return to him. Now, up until this point, there is no recorded uh, 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 bringing someone back to life. That's not to say it had happened. But there is no record of somebody being dead and being brought back in the Bible. Again, God could have done it many times, but it ain't recorded. This is the first time that we see that someone is brought back to life. Why do I bring that up? Because it's quite possible that Elijah had never heard or seen of a dead person being brought back to life. But he was operating on knowing a God that could do something that had never been done before. Why is that important for us to remember? Because many of us find ourselves in situations that we may think nobody has been in a predicament like I've been in. Nobody has been in the spot that I've been in. Nobody has been dead like I've been dead. No relationship has been dead like mine has been dead. No child has been dead like mine has been dead. Elijah said, I don't have any precedent of God doing this before, but I'm just crazy enough to ask him to do something about this situation. I haven't seen it done. I haven't heard about it being done. But I serve a God who can make a difference. I know he's able. I know he's able. I know he's able. And Elijah says, I might not have seen him do it before, but I know, I know I serve a God who can make a difference. That's the kind of confidence Elijah went into prayer with God. With God, I ain't heard about you doing this before. I ain't seen it done before, but I know who you are. I know who you are. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, sometimes we find ourselves in a valley of preparation and we don't know if God has ever done it for anybody else, but we just have to be crazy enough in faith to believe that if God is the God that we serve, that he's A-B-L-E. He's able. See, what prayer, what prayer does is it acknowledges the existence of God, of a living God, our Father, which art in heaven. See, prayer, prayer acknowledges that God is real. Prayer acknowledges that. Prayer not only acknowledges that God is real, prayer acknowledges our limitations and his all-powerful. Which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day. Ah, daily prayer. I'm unable to handle it, God, but this day, I need your power. Prayer not only acknowledges the existence of God and our limits, but it also acknowledges our dependence on him. And sometimes God has to break us from dependence on self. God has to break us from what we think we can do for others and for ourselves. Till we get to the point to say, Lord, I have no other option but you. And eventually, God does not become the last option. He becomes the first and only option. 
before chapter 18, before Elijah gets to the mountaintop experience, God has taken him through the valley of preparation. He prays for God to do something he's never seen God do before because in chapter 18, when he's on a mountain, he's going to pray to God to do something he's never seen God do before. You see the connection? He saw God privately do something. So when he got in the public, he was not ashamed to see him do something again. So you're going through in darkness right now. You, God is taking you through by yourself right now, but he's preparing you to shine forth in public. My brothers and sisters in Christ, let's go ahead and end, end this lesson. The Bible says in verse, verse 20, the Bible says in verse 22, that the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Elijah cried out, God heard. God heard. You know why God heard Elijah? Because the Bible says that God is near to the broken and the contrite in heart. You know why God heard Elijah? Because in Psalms 25, the Bible says that the Lord will lead the humble in a path that they should take. The humble means the broken, those who are moldable, those who can be led and guided. He heard them. Matter of fact, Jesus said it like this in John chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. But that abiding comes with humility. It comes with being moldable. And we've seen time and time again in chapter 17 that Elijah was humble to the will of God, to the word of God. God said it, Elijah did it. God said it, Elijah did it. Elijah heard God on numerous occasions. He heard God. Go talk to Ahab, Jezebel, tell him it ain't going to rain. He did it. He heard God. Go down to the brook and drink out of the brook and eat the food that the birds are going to uh, send you. He heard God and he did it. He heard God when he said, go find a widow in Zarephath and stay with her and tell her that the flour and the oil is not going to wear out. He heard God and he did that. Now it's time for God to hear Elijah. The Bible says Elijah cried out. The Lord heard him, and the life of the child returned to him, and he was revived. There's no need to try to find some natural explanation in this miracle. Some may say, oh, he just gave him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and brought him back like, no, 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 no. The Spirit of God was in that place. This was a straight-up miracle. And they had been experiencing a miracle day after day. How do we know that they had been experiencing a miracle day after day? Because the flour didn't run out. And they never had to go to the store to buy anymore. The oil didn't run out. And they never had to go to the store to buy anymore. The wood didn't run out. They never had to go to the store to buy anymore. Day after day, they had miracles. But sometimes we can get so used to God's miracles that we, can, we, we do not expect them to do something else. But God revived this child. And it's a miracle. And what did Elijah do? Verse 23. He took the child and brought him down from the upper room. Gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see. Your son is alive. <laughs> 30 minutes ago, you were blaming me for the death of your son. You were yelling at me. You was mad at me for the death of your son. I didn't even retort back. I didn't say anything back. I said, give me your son. And I took it to God. And look right here. Your son is now alive. Verse 24. Then the woman said to Elijah. Before we read what she said in verse 24, let's go back to read what she said in verse 18. Before her son had been revived, she says, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You've come to bring my iniquity before me and to put my son to death. That's the last remark we heard from her. That's when she was holding her dead son, cradling him. The only thing that she had left in this world to live for, looking at Elijah eye to eye, saying, You've killed my son. But in verse 24, 
as she was holding that son that was once dead, holding him now alive, she says, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. She says, I, 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 I was drawing close to God, but now I know that your God is real. I want something to do with that God. Now I know he's real. Why did my son die? He died so, I, so God can have the opportunity to draw you closer. It wasn't because of sin, but it was for God to get the glory. And my brother and sisters in Christ, some of us are dealing with some dead situations right now. And you're asking a question, why? Why is it dead? God said, that's why I can get the glory. Matter of fact, as we close in John chapter 9, the same question was asked by some parents. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, not by some parents, but by the disciples about a blind man. And the disciples asked God in John chapter 9, why has this man been born blind? Was it because his parents had sinned? Who sinned? Who sinned? That's why he's blind. Jesus says in verse 3, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might this be displayed in him. God said this blind man has been ordained to show the glory of God. His situation has been providential so that God will be glorified at the right time. Maybe you're in a blind situation. Maybe you're in a dead situation. But the Bible says that God brings sight to blindness and he brings life to those things that are dead. Even in John chapter 11, when Jesus, before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, in verse 4, he was talking to his disciples after he heard that his friend Lazarus was sick in verse 4, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified in it. You may be going through a gloomy, gruesome, and ugly situation now, but God has set it up for his glory. And when you see his glory, you'll be prepared for your mountaintop experience when he brings even greater glory to himself out of the growth in your life. So maybe you're not going through a trial, maybe you're not going through a tribulation right now, but the time will come when your valley of preparation will come. But I encourage you with eyes of faith to see beyond your training, to see God growing you for his us pray. Father, we thank you for the testimony of your servant and a preparation that you took him through to ever lean and trust on you. Father, where you have us right now, help us to see it as training ground for you to grow us, to prepare us for the next assignment you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let those who love Jesus say amen. Thank you for joining us for Sunday School this morning. We ask that you bear with us for the next 12 minutes as we transition to our morning worship beginning at 10 a.m. God bless.